Good morning, welcome again to Flaxo, Mexico. I'm Benjamin Temkin. I'm a professor researcher of Flaxo, and I also do research regarding subjective well-being. In this table, I think we are going to discuss and detail a little bit more some of the aspects that were covered in the lectures we heard before, and particularly the speech delivered by Dr. Diener. So what I think we are going to do here is to show that there are scientific foundations and statistic foundations to consider that the measures of subjective well-being can contribute to optimize as far as possible the public policies in the different countries and in Mexico. Just an idea before we begin, because since I began researching this, I was always asked, how do you measure happiness? And also, the word subjective well-being was invented by you so that people don't laugh a lot when you say you are researching happiness. Well, they are not laughing anymore at present. The most serious academics, the most important Nobel Prizes, the academic institutions, and particularly the statistic institutions in the world, are seriously trying to measure subjective well-being. I want to add, from my part, that the political philosophy and classical sociology, those books to which many go back often, talk about the well-being of people, a better society, and so forth, based on plausible theories or convincing theories, but oftentimes they seem not to require uh, or give us evidence with which we might, in fact, discuss and really corroborate. One of the great advantages and also disadvantage for the researchers doing this is that we have to measure, we have to teach how we measure, we have to justify how we measure, and we have to show that what we are measuring is what we are saying we are measuring. And in this regard, the clarity helps the discussion, and I think I think it helps to clarify and advance on the knowledge, on the scientific knowledge, and therefore the quality of the public policies regarding these issues. And with this, we are going to begin this conference, I'm sorry, this uh, round table. I'm going to introduce each one of the members of this panel in the order they will speak. I'm going to introduce them as they speak. The first lecturer, the first member. Ah, by the way, the dynamics is going to be kind of hard. You have a moderator who has been told to be disciplined, and I'm going to do that. And we have around 17 minutes per participants, given the delays in the agenda. And then we have a similar period to summarize and ask questions from the attendees. Well, the first participant is Dr. Jorge Yamamoto. He is professor of the psychology department of the Catholic University of Peru, visiting researcher of the Development Studies Center of the University of Bath, and general manager of research and continuous improvement, consultants in well-being and productivity. He has been investigating the models that explain the cases of high well-being, the adaptation processes to the hard conditions, 
sense of life, integrating them from the perspective of behavioral evolutionist anthropology. And his intervention is called Correlatings of uh, Subjective Wellbeing with Brain Activity. Dr. Yamamoto, you have the floor. Thanks a lot. Good morning. First and foremost, I want to congratulate the organizers for this event. And I want to thank the invitation to Mariano Rojas. Can you put the slides on the screen? Thank you. One question that was mentioned before that the audience asked and also the press and maybe some of those of you present is whether we can measure happiness. And when we say yes, they reply, really? So the measurement or the measure of uh, subjective well-being or happiness is within the field of the subjective processes. This measure of the subjective processes is widely used. For instance, in education, these subjective tests differentiate whether a child, a child is going to attend a school for regular children or special children. In many countries, a graduate of school will define if he goes to a school with little or high competitiveness through the use of these measurement tools. Likewise, uh, joining a work has to do with the evaluation of subjective processes like intelligence, personality, uh, work attitude, etc., and even promotions. So the measurement of uh, subjective processes is something widely used in our society. The well-being is one of the cases of subjective measures. But in fact, if we use the epistemology, the methods, and the instruments of the sciences in charge of more objective issues, the measurement will not be accurate and could be catastrophic. We require an ad hoc process. There's a discipline with standards and tools with psychometric tools that must be used. So as a conclusion, we can measure with validity and reliability the subject processes such as well-being. This is done through standardized procedures, and we assess the properties of these uh, subjective elements. But there's the problem that a great number of the well-being measures have not gone through this step. It's not an epistemolog epistemological process, but rather pragmatic and instrumental. However, the subject measure has had a status, uh, a second level status, like medicine. Many years ago, the medical uh, diagnosis was based on elements of the subjectivity of the physician, the color of the skin, the symptoms reported by the patient, but as years went by, it is increasingly based on subjective indicators, biomarkers, to make the diagnosis. So they may do blood tests, urinalysis, and therefore we have a more objective measure and a more accurate diagnosis. In this framework, the uh, psychiatry has been the ugly dog because it was a specialty that took more time to use these objective markers. But in the last few years, there has been an impressive progress on the biomarkers so that the depression, for instance, cannot only be diagnosed through the report or the observation of the lack of activity of an individual, but you extract an acid, you analyze the activity of the transportation of serotonin, and you can have a more objective diagnosis. So in order to improve this status of second uh, epistemological category, what we require is to use objective indicators. The question is, where are those uh, objective indicators in the case of happiness or subjective well-being? The answer is 
in the most fascinating organ of evolution, that is the brain, the human brain and non-human brain. The basis to, well, the objective basis of happiness are these. We are going to describe one of the multiple circuits involved in uh, measuring subjective well-being. So when having a problem, we need to find a solution, and the consequence is going to be a positive emotion. And therefore, that leads us to stress. This is related to how we react and prepare ourselves before threats. Basically, there are two systems or two reaction systems before stress. All of us experience this very clearly because of its intensity, is that we are driving through a road and then suddenly a car blocks our way, our heart rate increases, the brain is going to receive more blood, the immune system activates, getting ready for an accident to face it as best as possible, it to have more uh, or faster reactions. And this produces a response that maximizes our survival and our development. So the question is, where is this located? Well, apart from the heart rate, this is located in the sympathetic adrenomedular system. We don't want to go into the neurophysiological details of this, but there's a market that can be obtained in the saliva. This is the alpha milasa, considered a good objective marker of the activity of this sympathetic adrenomedular system. Thus, in 2009, we conducted an experiment that can illustrate the activation of the alpha milasa in their reactions before stress. This is an expedition to a cave called Dipadarguna. To date, it has not been explored totally. It's above uh, 4,500,000 meters in the Andes. The water you can see in the picture is uh, water from uh, thawing. Uh, the previous part is very warm, so you know whether to go very covered or not. So the, the cave is very small, and you have to take a decision whether to freeze in the cold part or to burn yourself in the warm part. So we have not evolved to live in darkness and to have a contrast of temperature or to be in confined spaces. So we made a measurement of the alpha milasa in the morning when entering the cave and at the end and they uh, broke the record of exploration and we made a an, uh, subjective assessment of the most stressful events, and they didn't match the activation of, uh, of the hormones. But we analyzed the conditions of physical strain required. They had more correlated with the measures of alpha amylase. So the, this gives evidence of something evident. Persons can be stressed without realizing so, or we can, may think we are stressed without having the harmful effects of stress in our health. Therefore, the objective measure along with the subjective one increases the precision of the process and increases to a different uh, epistemology status because I want to tell you, I might tell you I'm, I'm calm, but in fact I'm stressed and there's a test that goes beyond perception. But there's a second phase when reacting to stress. It takes around 20 minutes after having the threat and this is going to produce a series of glucocorticoids that have many effects and they allow the transformation of the reserves in our organisms in glucose if we were being chased by predators or other tribes uh, 40 or 180,000 years ago 
To concentrate the energies, our organism, mind and body, is going to cancel some functions of maintenance of the body. Therefore, in the long term, if we do not maintain this, if this is not solved in the short term, it's going to generate uh, harmful effects on the body. So the question is, where can we track and identify the activity of this second system based on glucocorticoids? And it's an axis involved, involving the hypothalamus, the cortical part of the adrenal gland. And cortisol is a great marker of the activity of this axis. So, trying to climb the Everest without oxygen and alone is an interesting experiment on how we react to stress because it has the conditions associated to the worst life conditions or a condition quite unhappy. Risk for life this is a picture taken by our uh, subject in an expedition to the Everest in 2010, and this is the picture of a person who died in that expedition, and our collaborator, Richard Hidalgo, was helping him to bury him, because you can't get a person who has died down. So these samples we took of cortisol are above the zone of death, above uh, 7,600 meters above sea level, where human beings cannot adapt, and the social support having someone in case of difficulty has been associated to welding, but this uh, climber is alone. So these are uh, suitable conditions to measure this uh, uh, stress, and we can assess them and uh, obtain new results. Here we found an inverse pattern to what we have observed in traditional experiments, that cortisol has a preparatory reaction, and after 30, 40, 50 minutes, is going to decrease. Here we found the opposite. This is exactly a moment before we try to summit. And as you can see, it is lower than the cortisol activation on the first Saturday at the hiker's or, or climber's home with his friends and family. But the, the posterior activation after he's coming back and, and, and the, reaching the second um, uh, camp and the climb, it, you, we have uh, up to 28 nanomoles per Later, but in, in extreme experiments, but here we have up to 36.5 nanomoles per liter. So this illustrates one of the multiple forms in which we can analyze stress. So the question we ask is why do people climb mountains if that goes against your well-being? Well, the evidence of various studies show that um, well-being is not the absence of problems, but uh, pro having problems that you can solve in a controlled way and that way uh, creating a virtuous cycle. Otherwise, the zoo would be the happiest place on earth for animals. However, they uh, become depressed and stop reproducing. What's interesting is how certain societies would be able to represent a system of prosperity and social um, security that would be similar to the Suda and would eventually lead to uh, to depression. However, in Latin America, which is uh, has been seen as one of the happiest regions of the world, world um, is uh, is fair, is uh, uh, an area which um, that's uh, very happy and and well, it, it sums up in a single observation, which is we're fucked up but we're happy and well anyway you can see this in in this image of, of the cave and this brings us to a to to the different genetic issues behind well-being not everyone is going to try and summit the Everest and in the the in the second system of the cortisol we found a gene that um, regulates glucose receptors and there are people who have uh, the N N three six three S polymorphic morphism which leads to less uh, stress regulation and therefore they these individuals have a greater capability to stress
stress more than over individuals. The, the COMT is another important well-being transmitter, and this polymorphism is found in certain individuals and is also related to a higher uh, response to stress. Also, in biomarkers for well-being, there are um, studies made by Carol Reef from the perspective of psychological well-being who have detected neurotransmitters um, that help um, objectively evaluate well-being. These studies, they're not necessarily directed towards well-being, but they do analyze the characteristics of certain uh, transmitters. For instance, dopamine is part of motivation and positive emotion. Um, so let's, let's visualize somebody uh, climbing a mountain, and it's this challenge, this activation, which is totally uh, dopamine-led, uh, which is different from the opioid um, pleasure of reaching the summit, relaxing, and being uh, happy. So we see two type of hedonistic relations, which are conducted by two different neurotransmitters. Um, so, so something else that's really important to see is that um, professional um, climbers don't see the summit as what they have to reach, but their house <laughs> back after their done climbing because when they reach the, the because if they reach the summit then you you would have a, a opioid trigger and that and that's why some some climbers who do that have the have accidents on the way down that's where most accidents happen so yes um, oxytocin and is perhaps and vasopressin is perhaps one of the most related transmitters to happiness in psychometric studies in the Andes and the Amazon in Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Cambodia, we've discovered that happiness of family and children is perhaps the most sustainable uh, 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 index for happiness. The, 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 this is a, a drug of social pressure that improves uh, social relations and is therefore one of the best candidates for uh, happiness biomarkers. It also regulates stress, and well, we've found in Taylor and Gonzalez uh, studies that, well, when we have a problem, we, we have a cortisol uh, triggered, and that uh, triggers vasopressin, which leads to trying to find help. And if you don't find help and the, you say, leave me alone or, or something, or you try and find help and you don't find it, which is hard in, in Latin America, well, people will, will pretend to help, uh, but they'll at least listen to you. This will lead to a drop in cortisol the soul, and this will produce uh, opioids, and this will generate a virtuous cycle where we'll have um, uh, well, biomarkers would be would be uh, um, opiates uh, for for the regulation for social regulation. Well, the conclusion is well-being can truly be measured, and it involves subjective processes that can be reliably uh, studied through psychometric uh, processes, and they involve it involves objective processes that can be objectively measured through um, through through genetic studies. Now, with $150, you can study any of these polymorphism. Well, biomarkers, you don't need to take uh, blood out of this. You just need uh, a s saliva. And it, this underscores the importance of neuroscience, of neuroscience. It would be false to say that we could do a study with the exact parameters, but this is just around the corner. And as the um, Inehi experimental measurements, the continuation of these studies will be required for us to have in the near future a very precise understanding of what um, subjective well-being and happiness or whatever we want to call it is. Thank you.